is the Tom Hartman Program. And welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. And on the line with us is is uh, Richard Wolf, uh, Professor of... Um, um, hang on just a second here, Richard. I lost my one sheet. I should have this memorized by now. Economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author most recently of Capitalism's Crisis Deepens, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown. Democracyatwork.info is the website. Also, rdwolf with two Fs dot com. And uh, democracy at WRK is the Twitter handle. Uh, Professor Wolf, welcome, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you with us. So, uh, boy, there are so many economic issues going on right now. Um, to to start out with uh, stock buybacks, I, I've been talking for some time about how, um, in particular, the last time that we uh, let companies bring hundreds of billions or tens of billions or whatever it was of uh, offshore stashed no tax money back to the United States at a low tax rate, almost all that money was used for stock buybacks. And people don't understand what that means or, you know, what that, how, why executives would do that, why companies would do that, what are the consequences to the stock market and what does that do to our economy? Well, uh, it's a mouthful, but I think uh, the nub of the issue is, is this. Companies get certain kinds of benefits if their stock price is rising in the stock market. And the way capitalism works, the board of directors, let me pick a a corporation out of the hat, General Motors, but what I'm saying applies to them in general. Uh, You've got a board of directors of 15 or so people, and one of their extraordinary powers in, in a capitalist corporation is to decide what to do with the profits. They may have one or 200,000 workers, as GM has, and they all contribute in some way to produce the product that generates the profits. But all those profits are gathered together, and the decision as to what to do with them is made by the board of directors, this very small uh, outfit, this 15 people. And they are completely free, for example. They can decide to use those profits, part or all of them, Uh, to hire more people, to expand production. And that, of course, would be good news for people with jobs, communities where these jobs are going to be uh, created, etc., etc. But they are equally free to do anything else they might like with those profits. And here's what they've done that you point to and that others have pointed to. They are free to use the profits to buy back their own shares on the stock market, just as if they were anyone else. So it is, in fact, normal procedure nowadays that a corporation can decide to use any portion of the profits it wishes to, and I'm talking about the board of directors because they're the ones who make this decision, to buy back the shares of their stock. So now why would they do it? Well, obviously, if a company goes in and uses massive portions of its profits to buy its own shares, that's going to drive up the value of the shares in the market. And now suppose that the uh, rewards to top executives uh, are linked to the price of the stock in the market, which often happens. You are, in effect, boosting the bonuses and other things your top executives are getting by this highly artificial manner of jacking up the prices of shares. Let me give you another example. Suppose the board of directors includes a sizable number of people who are themselves owners of shares in the company, which is very often the case. If they use the profits to go into the market and buy shares, they're driving up the value of their own shares because they're owners of shares. So here you have one of the many examples in which the self-serving behavior of corporate boards of directors uh, and top executives can in fact not only manipulate the stock market, but do so at the benefit of the tiny number of people who are making the decision, 
and there is no need or logic that would suggest that what they do for their own benefit is either what's good for the country as a whole or even what's good for the long-term health of that corporation. So it, it's a very serious problem. Even people who love capitalism have recognized that. And it has been particularly important in the last 10 or 15 years because corporations reacting to the difficulties of American capitalism, particularly since 2008, have been unwilling to take the risk of actually producing more and so are using their profits not to grow the company but to fool around in the stock market because for the people at the top, this is a very personally profitable activity. Dr. Wolf, is there a, uh, or what is the history of this? I, my understanding is that um, in the 1980s, uh, either Congress or the Reagan administration or somebody changed slightly the tax code to make it much easier for uh, senior executives to be compensated with stock options in ways that uh, led to a lot of this behavior. But I'm wondering when, if that's the case, if, I, if my understanding of this history is correct, what, when were the laws put into place that they essentially repealed during the Reagan administration? Is this, for example... This jacking up stock prices by buying back shares to reduce the number of shares available to increase scarcity, right. increase price. Is that something that was going on in 1928, 1929? Is this, you know, and, and then they put an end to it with the, with the New Deal? I mean, what's the history of this? No, it goes up and down. In other words, it depends on a whole lot of variables as to what the rules and laws have been. Uh, sometimes they, they have unintended consequences. In other words, they'll change a tax rule or a tax law. For example, the 1980s, the law was changed that it was actually a progressive impulse to say that uh, corporations, if they paid top executives more than a million dollars a year, they could not deduct the amount they paid to a top corporate executive above a million. They could not deduct that as a cost of hiring that executive and therefore reduce their taxable income, which they had been able to do up until this $1 million cap was put. The problem was now corporations had a reason not to pay their executives over a million dollars, and this was a difficult because many of the top executives were already earning beyond a million dollars. So you had to, in effect get around this law, which is what corporations hire economists and accountants to do, and one of the ways was this business of boosting your own shares in the market, because this way you could, in a sense, up the payment to your top people without running afoul of what that million-dollar cap on what you could count as an expense. And so they started doing that. There are many examples where things done uh, for one reason by a congressional committee turn out to provide opportunities that accountants who are paid big bucks bring to these corporations and say, oh, look, here's something that was done for completely other reasons, but it creates an opportunity for us to rejigger how we go about using profits to benefit whoever it is that's making these decisions. Yeah. Do you do you see? We have uh, thirty seconds till we're going to hit a hard break here. Do you do you see any changes on the horizon with regard to this? Well, you see, in my view, this is an endless game. You and I and people of good spirit can come up with this or that rule, this or that adjustment. But we're dealing with an army of people paid much more than we are to get around whatever it is we can even get through. And these days we can't get through much with Trump and the GOP. But even if we could, the experience under the Democrats has always been the same. If you don't change, I hate to keep beating this mantra, but if you don't change the basic system, then we're going to do this endless game of an adjustment here or there, and they will quickly figure out how to get around it. And then you and I and folks like us will discuss another adjustment, and we'll do it, and they'll get around it, and everybody will go home and, and go to the beach because nothing is changing. Yeah, remarkable. We're talking to Dr. Richard Wolf. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Dr. Richard Wolf, economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work. Democracy at Work.info is the website. And uh, we'll be right back with uh, uh, more of my interview with Dr. Wolf. And 
welcome back. Uh, Professor, you're still with us, right? Yeah. We have you for the half hour, is my understanding correctly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on the Republican tax plan uh, or, or what we've seen or heard of it so far. Well, you have to pre preface everything you say about this subject by the fact that not the least horror of what's going on is the endless omission of key dimensions of what they are supposedly discussing and bargaining over, uh, the omission of letting the public know so that everything I'm about to say has to be qualified by relying on press reports that are admittedly incomplete, here is what I would say. This is an exercise which for me is less about economics, even though I'm an economist, and really much more about psychology and political manipulation. Leading officials from the president on down endlessly repeat, like a song, that this is a tax cut that is going to benefit the middle class, that this is a tax cut that's going to improve the conditions of the mass of people, the votes of people who voted for him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you look at the specifics as much as we know of them, the story is completely different, so different that it kind of takes your breath away. It's a level of fakery uh, or of denial. I'm not sure what the best word is, but the gap between what is being proposed and what is being said, even for us who watch this stuff fairly often, is extraordinary. So let me give you just a couple of examples. The estate tax in the United States. The Trump administration has announced it's going to finally end the federal estate tax. So let me explain what that means. All estate taxes around the history of the world for, for hundreds of years have been premised on a basic idea, which is that life ought to be played on a level playing field that all of us as children should have roughly equal opportunities to develop our skills, apply ourselves, and do as well as we can in the course of our working lives. And that an estate tax is a way to get that done, because what it does is it says, you can keep all of the wealth you earn during your lifetime, but we're not going to let you deliver it all into the hands of your children because that will give your children an extraordinary advantage over other children when neither the one nor the other child had anything to do with the circumstances into which they were born. In other words, to create a level playing field, there needs to be a significant tax on estates, at least above a certain amount that radically alters your chances in life. And the United States, like other societies, did that. Starting about 30 years ago, successive efforts of wealthy people who did not want to pay the estate tax at the federal level were successful. So much so that today, as I'm speaking with you, uh, you can leave the first $11 million dollars uh, of wealth that you have, if you uh, and your husband or you and your wife, to your children or anyone else you designate, and there's no federal estate tax. In other words, it's basically been eviscerated. But of course, there is a tiny percentage, way less than 1% of the American people, uh, who have so much wealth that they still would owe federal estate tax. Right. Because and, they're leaving. and they're pushing the process. Hang on just a second, sir. Hey, you've heard Hi, I'm Valerie with Free Speech TV. We're proud to provide you with independent, unfiltered news and documentaries. And as our valued viewer, you can help us continue bringing Free Speech TV well into the future. Join our Pearly Gate Rebels, our planned giving program. Your gift of any size will help ensure democracy endures through an informed citizenry. You can donate property, money, or assets. It's easy. My spouse and I are proud Pearly Gate Rebels. We're doing our part to ensure that Free Speech TV will be here to deliver thought-provoking news and information well into the future. Join us. Call 877-378-8669 or email me at Valerie at freespeech.org. 
rebel against media owned by billionaires and become one of our pearly gate rebels today. Essays on the global economic meltdown, democracyatwork.info is the website. And as well as rdwolf with two Fs dot com is uh, Richard's website, and uh, dem and you can tweet them at democracy at wrk, uh, democracy at wrk. If I have that right, Professor Wolf, uh, welcome back. Thank you. So uh, I, I, I'd like to talk to you about Catalonia. I I, I was um, invited to uh, Barcelona about must have been seven eight years ago to uh, jointly. Uh, present with a member of the German Parliament who had come up with, uh, as I as I recall, his name was something Schmidt, uh, maybe Hel but in any case, he was one of the two German legislators who put together the hundred thousand rooftop program that's basically solarized Germany. And I was speaking on my book, Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, and, and Louise and I had a wonderful time there. We got to know a whole bunch of people, and the story that I heard from the locals was that there had been this movement to bring back uh, the, the, Catalo the Catalonian language that they were teaching in the public schools, and that uh, the Catalonian region, or Catalonia, was really developing its own culture, always had its own culture, and they were kind of thinking of themselves as a separate folk, a separate people. And uh, this was years ago. And, and I thought at the time, you know, geez, if they're, if they're, if they're even in their schools, they're using not... Spanish, but Catalonian, then, you know, where does this end up? But um, I, I know that, there, that you've been talking about this in the context of economics, that, that you know, the, the, how the great crash is driving this. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, I'd be glad to. The, the way that the, the crash figures in is it's really important for people to understand that since 2008, the crisis, the second worst since the Great Depression of the 30s, is playing itself out very bitterly and very slowly, that the story of quote-unquote recovery is really a story about a very small percentage, 10% or less, of the society has in any meaningful way recovered. The other 90% are still struggling with enormous consequences, things like the following, lower wages than they had before, lower benefits with the jobs they have than before, much less security of the job, much greater precariousness, and so on. Reduced government services because government entities are strapped for taxes, etc., etc. And the end result is economic suffering, economic inequality really going off the charts. And it makes people angry and upset. And here's where you have to get a little subtle in the analysis. I understand it's economic. You do, and a bunch of us do. But for the mass of people, there's been a 50-year period now when questioning or challenging or criticizing capitalism, the economic system, was kind of off the agenda. Taboo, scary, having something to do with the Cold War. We didn't go there. So people developed the habit of looking elsewhere. It's a little bit like, and pardon my metaphor, if you have a bad day at the job and you come home and in your frustration you smash a dish. Well, the dish didn't cause your difficulties, and smashing it is not going to solve your difficulties. But you displace the upset. What's going on in Europe now is such economic turmoil that masses of people are doing things that are like smashing a dish. They're taking steps that are clearly reflections of their economic distress and their failure to see any solution on the horizon, and they're quite right about that, but they're taking it out by doing what? The British working class voted to leave Europe for Brexit, not understanding that this is not a solution to what ails them and might very well make the situation worse. Something similar is going on in Scotland. All over Eastern Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, and elsewhere, people are raging against Europe. But that, of course, is not their problem in Eastern Europe. What they had hoped for was that by leaving the old Soviet bloc and entering Western Europe, they would all have economies like Germany, France, and Sweden. 
what they're discovering is that the place being prepared for them looks more like Greece and Portugal and Spain, and they are freaked out by this, and so they're denouncing Europe and becoming nationalists. So now finally, Catalonia. Spain has had a terrible time, an unemployment rate over 20%, lasting for now almost a decade. It's a very serious problem. They don't know where to turn. They have a conservative austerity government that doesn't know what it's doing, or worse, is making the situation unbearable. And so it's not surprising that people are looking around for somebody to blame and for somewhere to go. You know, here in America, we're doing something similar by finding immigrants, as if expelling immigrants was the problem we had and would be the solution to that problem. It isn't, it won't be, but it is a temporary palliative. I'm afraid that the struggles in Catalonia between uh, the effort to be independent versus to be part of Spain is a little bit like that. They should be having the right to do that, of course. On the other hand, it's not the problem, and it's not going to be the solution if they are successful. And meanwhile, the Spanish government, in its horrible reversion to things that look really bad, and if you know the history of Spain, yeah. is only going to make the situation worse, whether they get their independence or whether they don't. Remarkable. Professor Wolf, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, Tom, and I hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you, sir. Call 202-808-9925. And for more of Richard Wolf's work, uh, check out democracyatwork.info. And you can tweet him at democracy at WRK or at Prof. Wolf with 